On today's Locked On Pelicans, we got Gus Cattengill, who called all the Pelicans games in Vegas. He's got the boots on the ground perspective with the vibes from Summer League. Who might have earned more minutes next year and what we'll see from the offense? It's the Wednesday, Thursday, Thursday. I know what day of the week it is. Episode of Locked On Pelicans. Let's go. You are Locked On Pelicans. Your daily New Orleans Pelicans podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to another edition of Locked On Pelicans, the daily podcast covering your favorite team, the New Orleans Pelicans and NBA, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day, available wherever you get your podcasts and available on YouTube. I'm your host, Pelicans Insider, credential member of the media, Jake Madison, at Nola Jake on Twitter. I get to turn the tables on (laughs) Gus Cattengill today. Who I'm on, I was on your show earlier this week. You normally, you're asking me questions. I get to flip it on you today. Yes. No, I loved it. This is, uh, it it actually is one of the things that I don't mind doing in that um, I get to just respond and just kind of see what I say. Cause a lot of times Jake, and you get this a lot of times when you host a show, you'll have like an idea what it is that you want to say. And then you probably don't say two thirds of what it is you want to say, you forget so many different things or you just kind of get going on one area or tangent or stuck on something. And then it's a commercial break and then it's somebody else on and then it switches to saints. So I, I love this. this is great because I did see a lot of things. I did get a lot of things out of being there for 12 days, not only on the There's basketball so much court. time <laughs> in Vegas. Like, yeah, three is. days okay. is too long in Vegas, I think. 12 days. Mm-hmm. It's commitment right there. Um, and yeah. everyone who's who's watching thank you for making lockdown pelicans your first listen today and every day if you want to support the channel become an everyday or listen monday through friday all right let's get into it so you were there right like there is there's a lot of value in being in person i remember early on when i started covering the team and doing all this i asked like a scout like do you really need to be on the road can you just watch the games on tv and you know save money make it easier on yourself and they kind of explain the value of being there and really seeing little things that broadcasts don't pick up you feel the same way after watching the team practice on all that like what was the general feeling of like the vibes around the team that you yeah. don't necessarily see through watching it i do because even being part of the broadcast and stuff you know this jake i mean you're still limited to what you can sort of see and um i guess you know sort of the brief background what, what i love is being a saint sideline reporter for two seasons being a two-lane you know sideline reporter for i don't know 13 seasons 13 14 seasons i think and i was also the play-by-play for two-lane women's basketball so when you combine all of that traveling with a team being around the team being a part of a team is different than even just going to games or even not going to games i mean i know there's some people that don't go or have or can only go to so many I, I just think the more you're around it the more you're acclimated to it the more you see it and the more you get to know people right I mean Jake like you and I talk you know without doing work stuff or we'll do work stuff but the more we communicate we kind of get to know that maybe I know what yeah. you want to eat maybe I know what you want to drink you know um I can tell when you're having a bad day I, I can tell when something's on your mind it's weighing on you those are things that a lot of times you don't see when a broadcast opens and there's Joel and AD and then they're showing guys warming up, which by the way was shot before that because the player intros are happening when they do that. Their intro was shot well before you actually see the intro to the game. So all of that matters, I think, mm-hmm. right? Because you, you can tell, I mean, look, if somebody – is unhappy contractually, is unhappy at home, is unhappy or not feeling well, it will affect their game. But if we don't know that, if we just turn the game on and go like, this guy's terrible, and Jake's going, this dude's 2 of 16, I mean, you got to do better. We don't know what's going on. So you do get an, uh, an, an insight into that. So from that aspect, um, I, I've seen some of those members on the staff, Jake, but I, I never met you know Tom, one of, you know the head trainer, and, and doing stuff with the team. Um, I, I've heard of the famed Fred Vinson, right? But mm-hmm. seeing Fred Vinson all the time and seeing how he works with different players and just different aspects of it. Um, I, I know Casey Hill. 
but now I know Casey Hill, right? I'm mean, sitting on the line, sitting in a pool for a couple hours with Casey <laughs> Hill and li- listening to he and the That's staff what's great about the summer league in Vegas, though. 100%. Just everyone is like accessible. You can just even run into people. It's so much fun. Totally, totally. And the thing about it too, Jake, is like, you know, the stories. I mean, you're, you're hearing people this about this game or it's this restaurant. It always starts with the restaurant. Uh, you know, and it's always like, oh, that, that was after we got drubbed by the Knicks for 31 and, you know, oh, Willie didn't want it. So it's just, you, you get an idea of their personalities. And, and I think that's the one thing I took away. I even, I think, brought it up when you came on our show. The one thing I took, I would take away non-basketball related in terms of like on the court stuff, mm-hmm. you do have a staff that cares. Like you, what I what I say that is they're basketball people. Like they do care about their players and one of the things I said on Fox 8 Overtime earlier in the week about the grade I would give Casey Hill, and I gave it an A, was because he was tasked with trying for over 12 days in five games, do a handful of different things with different players that they needed to do. When it comes to Dyson Daniels, that guy is going to be a guy is going to be on the quarter ton. We need to work on this offense. We need to work on his playmaking. Come. So, so we, to follow up on that quickly, yeah, like sure. where does that directive come from to Casey Hill? Is that from Willie Green? Yeah. Is that from David Griffin? Like how do they kind of get to maybe some of those priorities? Again, I think that's the beauty of what I, I got to do. In our broadcast, we we were given David Griffin game one, Trajan Langdon game two, Swin Cash game three, and Bryson Graham game four in charge of scouting. So we had a pretty good overview of, of the top four people, if you would look at it that way, yeah. Jake, of people in charge of roster development, roster, you know, rounding out, signing players, vision, all of that. And what I gathered was it is one table, one room. You know, a lot of times we'll speculate. Maybe mm-hmm. the coach wants to go in this direction. Maybe, yeah. you know, David Griffin wants to go in this direction. Does he and Trajan see the same way? I what I got in those four interviews was they all see one thing. And what I did get, I've had Trajan Langdon on before a season ago, and they do take all of the input before coming with the decision. And what I mean by that, Jake, is let's take, for example, um, Herb Jones was a perfect example. I remember talking to Trajan on my show, and Willie Green was the one to go like, we got to play this guy. They, they really didn't have that vision for maybe playing her, right? I mean, who now mm-hmm. has signed a brand new contract. But his play in summer league, his play in training camp, when they all got together in September, they were like, this guy Those off-season got workouts, yep. Exactly. And, and so you heard, I didn't obviously saw it, but that's what I'm getting at. It's that maybe David and Trajan have this vision for a player, but they do take what coach says. And then also sometimes they let coach say, hey, look, maybe this player can sort of done that. And you saw that with him having eventually go to different players and younger players, whether it's Alvarado, whether it's Najee, Trey Murphy, things of that nature. So I, I will say that it, I got at least the sense they all have at least an outline of what they want to do. They talked about the vision with all of their different players and what they want to do. So I did get that. And that was something that was unique. Again, getting to see how Casey Hill coaches practice. And I, I got a lot of that from a guy that doesn't even coach here. Um, his, his name was Greg um, Vander Vanderjack, and he was a guest of the Pelicans. He's an assistant in the Australian Basketball League, knows Dyson and all of that, which was great. I had him on my show. It's the number one sport in Australia right now. Yeah, their league's big down there. Yeah. I get like a ton it, of listeners from there and everything. 100%. So it was so cool to hear like, he was talking about there's a sophomore in high school on his team and you know they're not going to college but thinking of the nba and all those different aspects the whole reason i'm bringing him up though jake is he specifically said certain things on how they coach practice tough hard defense minded he just kept using the phrase coaching it the right way learning basketball the right way doing those things so what i got out of those 12 days was they coached that summer league session to prepare you for coming up in September, coming up in October. They, they, they did drills that I asked coach Casey about. That was really cool where they would just go silent. And and I'm sitting there, I'm like, you know, sitting there silent. He just did a hand signal. They didn't call out the play. There was no communication between players and everything. I'm like, 
this is easy to find out if you know where you're going and where yeah. you're supposed to go. And sure enough, at the end of practice, I asked Coach Hill, I'm like, so when you guys went silent like that, he goes, it, it's to make sure that they know where they're supposed to be, the ball movement, because it the ball didn't touch a hand for longer than a second, Jake. So I went around the arc, across the paint, into the corner, back to the top of the key layup. And it, it just it just kept rotating and it was dead silent. Not 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 a not a sound. And it was cool to see that from that perspective, but that's on purpose. That comes from probably how Willie runs practice. That's that attention to detail that you hear from Willie, the point five where the ball yep. moves around quickly, but it's also knowing where you're going. You hear that the coaching staff harp on it so much. You have to know where you are on the floor. So those guys that may see action this year, those guys that may see a ton of action in Birmingham to develop their game, they're all being coached the same way. And that's why I think they can sort of transition and help the big program, if that makes any sense to you. So again, that's stuff you see at practice. Yeah, that was that was something that David Griffin talked about in the beginning of he, you know, when you say it's kind of all like one mind, one table, right? I think the analogy he uses, they're all in the same bus and the bus is going. I think I've heard him say that. And there's got to be alignment there, right? They want the offense in Birmingham being the same offense that the Pelicans yep. use. So that if you do call a guy up, they're ready to go. If you do want to make some changes with your coaching staff, you can, you know, bring guys up. Ryan Pannoni, who's no longer here, was one of those. He was the Birmingham head coach. Then he came to the NBA level. And it adds, I think, that degree of continuity to all of that, which in a small market or just a team trying to be competitive in general, I think is super important. So let's let's talk about some of the players, though. Let's talk about well, Hawkins. Sure. Uh, Daniels, Liddell, Sebron. That's all going to be coming up here next in today's episode of Locked on Pelicans. Before we get to that, though, today's episode of Locked on Pelicans is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook. Take your first swing at betting MLB on FanDuel and get 10 times your first bet amount in bonus bets up to $200. FanDuel is America's number one sportsbook. And just bet 20 bucks and you'll land $200 in bonus bets, win or lose. That's 200 you can spend betting everything from the money line to the over under to who you think is going to hit the first home run. Probably Otani is who I would be betting on there. All on an app that safe secure and super easy to use and plus when you get win you get paid instantly and there's no better place to bet on mlb than fanduel america's number one sports book so sign up today and visit fanduel.com slash locked on to get up to 200 dollars in bonus bets that's fanduel.com slash locked on fanduel official partner of major league baseball and thank you for making Locked On Pelicans your first listen today and every day. We're here Monday through Friday, the number one Pelicans podcast. No one else coming to you like this. We have the live show, don't forget, every Thursday at 7 p.m. on there. You want to ask me questions in real time or just maybe complain about something. We get people like that, too, or be excited about something else. We get all of that. So make sure you join live 7 p.m. Central. And today we've got Gus Cattengill of ESPN Radio, the sports hangover First time guests on the show. I don't bring guests on very often. I just don't have like time. I record at weird hours. Uh, so I'm glad you're able to make time for me today. And I get to turn it around and ask you questions here. Yeah. So when I was on your show, we were talking about the players. You know, I, I can give you what I saw. And I, you know, I liked what I saw for the most part from a lot of these guys. But you were there. You were seeing them in practice. You had that great insight of how like kind of their, their plan is catered to them, specifically made for them. You know, who impressed you the most on the summer league roster for the Pels? I kind of agree with you, man. I think Darian Sebron is really the player that stood out to me from this aspect of it. Because, again, I was kind of referencing with Casey Hill. He had to do different things with different players, right? So you had players trying to work back from injury and, and trying just to get to where their vision is. That was EJ Liddell. You have a first-round draft pick. We want to make sure that he's comfortable and understands what he's doing with Jordan Hawkins. Dyson Daniels, we want to develop an offensive thing. But Darian Sebron, it's interesting because he did do some damage, if you want to call it. Um, yeah, he was, in, he in was the best player on the team, I think, very easily. There you go. Um, when you spoke to him after games, he wasn't shy about it. He was very short and to the point. Aaron Summers asked him, what is your goal in Summer League? And he's like, to show that I'm an NBA player. I, it's like, right now I have a two-way, but I want to be with the NBA team and show that I can contribute and do that. And again, Jake, this is where I go to what I – got to see by being there and understanding and being fair, right? Whether it's you, myself in business or whatever it is, just tell me what you want right. or be honest with me and, and 
let's see if I can do it or not one way, shape, or form, whether it's a deal that can close or what is that we need. And Darren Sebron quickly told would say, I need to play defense. I need to not turn the ball over. And I need to show seven that in I that can, first game. <laughs> well, but that's the thing. But he's like, I need to be able to show that I can do a lot of different things on the court. There is no question. And he has all the confidence in the world. When he wants to get to the rim, he will get to the rim. When he wants to score, he can do that. But as you know, and as you've seen in the last two years, I would say there are examples of players, whether it's Jose Alvarado and Najee getting a chance to see more minutes, um, even Trey to an extent. I mean, Trey got sent down to Birmingham for a reason. You have to play defense. You have to be able to show that you're not going to have that minus and that plus minus. I mean, you guys harp on that. We talk about it so much. You can't affect the game negatively when you're on the floor for one way, shape, or form. So coming back after that game and then seeing him be more under control, it was interesting, Jake. I looked at Aaron in that game, and then afterwards we wrapped up, did our post game, and I said, he just looks like a player that's trying to prove rather than just playing the game. And in other words, yeah. he was just going too fast. He was just he was just trying to make every play. Every drive had to finish at the rim. Every way to – he was going – fast almost too fast if that makes any sense we hear it in mm -hmm. baseball football and basketball you can't think you just got to react and play the game play the game in front of you but it's like let it come to you you know like let the game come to you in a sense right like don't eat those are there's all those cliches but they're cliches for a reason because it's true 100 percent. he slowed down a tad bit next thing you know he's leading the team in points uh mm -hmm. he did that several times out of the five games but i was impressed too it's the one thing that i know you've uh, had to talk about with me on my show. And sometimes during the game, we'll text each other. When this team struggles the most is when the offense shuts down or it's stagnant and it's, you know, dribble, dribble, shot clock, ball not moving. The other thing they struggle is they they felt, especially last time, if Zion and B.I. on the court, you don't feel like you have that player that can push the pace, that can push the tempo, that can just get to the rim. Um, I've always said it too, it's, understanding the room, reading the room, you're point guard for a reason. If you're a point guard and you play high school and you're the lead point guard, pretty good. If you do it in college, you're really good. Like you have to understand how to run all that stuff. You, you playing at any kind of pro level, you're a point guard for a reason. You can either handle the basketball, you know how to pass the basketball, but you can understand tempo and pace. And so many times I get frustrated and get some gray hairs is that you're looking at it. It's a four, two to six, two to an eight, two to 10, two run. And the Pels are just jacking up shots or taking back. Take the ball to the rim, man. Go to the free throw line. There were a lot of times, Jake, where Darian Sebron did not complete the layup for an and one opportunity. But he went to the free throw line on two free throws. And it stopped the run of momentum. It gave a breather to the team. They had hit two threes. Here he comes 100 miles an hour down the lane, you know. And you just see that repeatedly. If you watch any of the highlights from Summer League, Jake, almost every highlight is him driving down the lane, dunking, laid it in, getting hit, going to the floor. He was um, he went to the line eighth most in Summer League. He, he ranked go. eighth in terms of free throws per game, which right. is Who, incredible, right? Like he's not a big, you know? It tells you how he plays in like kind of the like hyper aggression he has at times. You said that word. He's 6'5". And mm -hmm. that's the thing when you look at it. I, I, we love Alvarado. We love Kyra Lewis. We love a lot of some of the other guards too as well. This guy has the size. And you saw a lot of guys trying to play defense on him. Him and Dyson Daniels in that backcourt, they, they, they both had size. They both could create on the defensive end. And you saw, you know, Darian come up and, and shot block off of the glass. You would see him get his hands and create steals in the passing lane. And it, it can get tight, Jake on the corners, on the wings, on the left and the right wing. When you got a guy like Dyson, they went zone a couple of times. And in one game in particular, they did a lot of zone. And when you got Dyson and when you got Sebron playing the zone portions of the guard, they, they can close off a lot of passing lanes. They created a lot of, you know, turnovers, tip balls, kick balls. It just made it hard to kind of get in. And that's what I think really stood out with me. If he can continue to do that, he's just he's going to make it hard for you to not put it on the court one way, shape, or form. I don't know what the decision is with him. 
But yeah, you you think there's maybe pressing. like an outside chance that he's gonna yeah, have a real opportunity? Maybe it's not even an outside chance, but like a real opportunity yeah. in training camp. You know, they have an open roster spot. They don't have yeah. a guard that does what he does. So I was looking at it like this, Jake. There's four players. I think we, I, I I talked to you about it when you came on the show. There's four players that are going to play in the FIBA World Classic. We know about mm-hmm. Brandon Ingram for Team USA. He handles the ball. Jose Alvarado is going to play. He handles. They're gonna play each other. I'm so excited for that game. <laughs> it's gonna be fun. Um, Dyson Daniels, is a point guard, handles the ball. He's gonna play for Australia. Then Jonas is gonna play as well. So those four players. Jonas is the only one, and he does bring the ball up every now and then. But my point being, they it starts August 25th, and it ends September 10th. The first preseason game for the Pelicans is October 10th. So they're going to get a lot of run, a lot of practice, a lot of playing. I don't see Brandon Ingram getting a lot of time in preseason. Even Alvarado, you and I talked about this when you came on the show. I think mm-hmm. it's great that he's getting – that opportunity right now to get back in shape and all do that. But again, that's a guy that I can see makes a difference when he's not on the court and all my team. So we need to make sure he's good, give him some breather and all that. Darian Sebron's going to have an opportunity to play a lot of preseason minutes is what I look at. So when you're asking me, can he push for that spot? If he plays now an NBA preseason time against maybe if some other teams have some starters out there and you see success, He's not turning the ball over. He's getting to the rim and he's creating havoc on the defensive end strips and fast break opportunities. And there's, and ones, and you are mentioning him in locked on Pels in the four preseason games. He's going to make it hard. He's going to make it hard on this team to, to say, we think it's better for you to be in Birmingham. Now, does that mean if he makes the roster, he's playing 12, 15 minutes a night. There's no, there's just no spot, but it's a useful change of pace guy to have. There, there you go. And, and maybe it is every other game and maybe it's matchups. And, and Jake, we saw that with Willie Green last year, right? Some games, here, here's Jonas on the offensive end. Other games, we're going to go with Larry. You know, so I, I don't know if that's maybe an adjustment you have. I just think it's an option. And I think in any any shape or manner, the more options you have, my wife does this all the time when we go travel. She wants options. <laughs> you know, it's two bags. She needs 20 shoes. Um, give me options. Now, I know I can call you back. You can drive up. You can be ready on a game night, but it's not the same thing because you want him practicing with the team and being around like that a little bit more, too. He's the other guy, right? He's the other guy Mm -hmm. you got to go defend and practice against, and it makes you better, right? There's a steel, sharpened steel sort of thing. So, yeah, exactly. I think it'll be interesting. So, but yeah, he stood out. No, that's it's it's, it's going to be interesting. As, you know, as I said, like it, they have a small backcourt. CJ McCollum is undersized. Jose is ve- I, I might be taller than Jose, and that's not right. to be right. mean to him, right? But no, it's like you talked it's a about thing. it though. When you have that that size, it, it's a it's, disadvantage. It is. It's it's really really important. Coming up, uh, let's get into these players a little bit more. I want I want your take sure. on Hawkins, who struggled shooting. Uh, I have a couple questions about the NBA guys too. Zion Williamson. Larry and Jr. who were both there in Summer League. We're going to look at all of that here with Gus Catendale coming up here next in today's episode of Locked On Pelicans. And thank you for making Locked On Pelicans your first listen today and every day. We're here Monday through Friday, the number one Pelicans podcast. We got a live show Thursday night, 7 p.m. We do this every Thursday at 7 p.m. Central. Come on, hang out in the chat, ask your questions. We'll talk about a couple of things too. I got some fun ideas for the show as well. So it's going to be a lot of fun. And if you want to support Locked On Pelicans, become an everydayer. Listen Monday through Friday. And if you're an everydayer, let me know in the comments down below on YouTube. So Gus and I are chatting about Summer League here. You know, you just went over Darion Sebron, who was the Pelicans, it's the MVP of the Pelicans in Summer League. I think yeah. that's safe to say. They went three and two. That's a, that's a very good record, I think, for what we saw from them. What about EJ or uh, not EJ, EJ Liddell. We knew was just going to do like EJ Liddell things. Like you're coming back from the torn ACL. There were really no expectations there, but what about a guy like Jordan Hawkins, the 14th overall pick that, you know, they picked for his fit. He's a shooter and he did not yeah. shoot well. You know, yeah. is this something that you think raises concerns going forward? Something that could impact his role or is it just like it's summer league? Yeah. I think it's a little bit of everything, right. From this aspect of it. If you didn't watch the games and you just look at the box score, you listen to reports or the sports, you know, uh, highlights of a night, it, it doesn't tell the whole story. And, and the reason why I say that is, you know, I'm not here to defend him. 
He didn't shoot it well. He'll tell you no, he, he did not. Well. Casey Hill said after the last game, he didn't shoot well. What I will tell you is in game five, he was better than he was in game four and better in game three. In games one and two, he couldn't buy a bucket. You know, I, I was um, trying not to channel my inner graph, but I'm like, this guy couldn't throw it in the ocean um, in games one and two. But he still had 16 points in games one and two. Mm-hmm. I remember asking Tracy Langdon in game two, who was our guest, I said, can this guy be a 20 to 22 point score? Um, because he got to the free and Jake on one of those games, he was one of six from the free throw line. Like yeah. he couldn't buy a bucket, but he still had 16 points and the shots were just literally going in and out. They were rimming in and out. A, a lot of them went down and were like good looks that just like, 100%. I don't know if the wind blows a little bit differently. If the air conditioning yeah. isn't as strong in the 115 <laughs> right. degree heat of Vegas, like maybe it goes in. So I, I think what I, tend to then look at is why why is that the case and what i noticed and what trajan actually brought up when he sat with us in game two they game plan for him the warriors did in game two they made sure that they were um bodying him up being very physical with him and that's something that he wasn't used to. I mean, it's a different level. And, and look, there's a different level from the guys that are going to be playing come the season in summer league. You, you mentioned it yourself. I mean, mm-hmm. there's going to be a lot it's, of those guys that are going to be playing professional basketball. I mean, they bring in like just pure ringers that chill in Vegas for 12 weeks. Not They're, they're not ringers because they're not good, right? right? Like I should right. not call, call them that. Right. They're like teachers and other things that just get to go yeah. play some basketball and get paid. It's a good gig. Right. I saw Tyson Chandler there with the Mavs. So, I mean, you know, but my point is like you, you, you look at it and and you, there's an adjustment level. I mean, there's an adjustment level to it. Mm-hmm. And, but at the same time, I think you'd have to be blind if you don't see, Oh, Oh, okay. I see that. Or, oh, okay. Well then there's that. And my job as a guy that's trying to call it and seeing it is try to give you a sense and, and be, be honest. Yeah. It's not making the shots but he's scoring, he's getting to the free throw line. What else is he doing on the court? And they don't win Sunday's game without what Dyson Daniels called a momentum turning drawing of a charge on that left Mm -hmm. elbow. He draws the charge. They right after that knock down a three. Then he scores on a fast break opportunity running down the left baseline I think it was Dyson or might have been Darian Sebron hits him with an alley oop where he catches it under the rim and lays it in reverse hand. He goes to the free throw line in that final minute and a half as well. Those are things that you're doing to help the team win. And in that final game, Jake, you saw it. He's hitting the ball off the backboard. And I think to me, the most impressive thing he did was he hit a three early, gets a defensive play, gets a shot block. And then the ball comes out to him. He's far side, taking it up the court. Jake, every person I know, me, the gym rat, the guy at the, you know, whatever fitness there, he is jacking up that three, right? <laughs> I mean, you, you are yeah. feeling good. Oh, I'm, you're I'm not good. You got the anything. heat check and everything there. Oh, yeah. you're absolutely just knocked out a three. just had a shot off the backboard. There's momentum. It's a fast break. It's going up. He passed left to Dyson, top of the key. One touch left pass to... Landers Nolly the second, and he hits a left wing three. I looked at Aaron and I said it in the broadcast. I said, that's the kind of stuff Willie Green is just smiling about right now mm-hmm. because he wasn't thinking about himself. And Jake, he's there for himself. Like, that's the time to do it. Right. No one was going to be angry for him to jack 25 threes and make two. Shoot it. Find your rhythm. Find your shot. These are the minutes that are for you. You're here, not Trey, not any. Do it. No one was going to get angry. But I love that confidence in him. He's fearless, man. He kept going to the rim. It didn't bother him. He would jaw back and forth to somebody. He got his tooth knocked out. I'm on IR for three weeks. Dude, I'm done. He went back in. Casey Hill's smiling. The rest of the team's smiling. He's just doing this. He played. He finished the game out, and the Pels won it. That's the kind of stuff. Jake, that I think goes a long way with your teammates. And let's just remember, as we go back to the initial thing you said, it's summer league. 
it's summer he's going to be playing in with bi he's going to be playing on the court with trey he's going to be playing on the court with zion he's going to be on the court with cj he's going to be on the court with larry nance you know he's going to be on the court with alvarado those guys going to open up more space those guys are going to know how to get him the basketball and he can score in so many ways. He's not that guy that sits in the corner and raises his hand and waits for the ball. The catch-and-shoot quickness that he has when he knocked down that first three, the fact that he can just jump, knock down the, the elbow jumper, he can drive to the rim like we saw. He did that put-back dunk. That, I, I mean, I love that. That's not a three-point shooter, right? You don't. No, but it's, it's, it shows you more to his game, right? Like he was coming in as a, as a shooter. It's, it's what he was known for. It's what he was drafted for. If you can show more than that, it's kind of eye-opening because, you yeah. know, I scouted him. I did a ton of it on it. And, you, don't, you know, that's not something you really consider or, like, add into his game and his evaluation. And he started showing you, he's like, I'm, you know, more than a shooter kind of. And it's yeah. like, oh, that's actually a really – useful player because look you know injuries have hit the team and stuff so you, you might need to do more um you mentioned you mentioned him in like some of the teammates right he's gonna be playing with other guys mm -hmm. zion was there it was nice yeah. to see him in vegas what was that like having him around the team for a little bit well it was funny because normally he would have got everybody's attention when he walked on the court jake but when he walked onto the court in that first quarter there was a kid from new orleans i'm sure you saw it oh he was wearing a pelican's jersey oh, i gave him a shout out on here Yes, he hit the he hit the half court shot. Yeah, that was so awesome. He hits the half court shot, and literally the entire you know Cox Pavilion is going bananas. And there, there goes Zion. You know, just walking in front. Casually. You know, I mean, yeah, exactly. Normally, you know, be like oh, saving everything. So, look, I, I think you saw everybody. I didn't see CJ McCollum. He might have been there. I don't know, but everybody else on the team. I saw at one point, shape or form. Um, it was interesting. Bi, you know, Bi's there to, to to coach, to look at. You could just see the scowl on his face when the Pels did play good defense in the first quarter. I love that, and, and that's why when I spoke again with with Trajan and whether it's Swin or David, they're so happy and think it's really going to be good that you have all these players pay, playing FIBA and all that. But look, it, it goes to this. Zion's appearance was a day or so after that, you know, Buker report where he has no desire. And I saw you, you know, post your comments about that and be like, look, in all fairness, there's a lot of things that he brings on himself. There's a lot of things that are absolutely fair. There's, there's a lot, a of, lot of very valid criticism for Zion. 100%. Like, yeah, I said like that on the show there's no week. getting around this. I said it on that the was show not one week. of them. That was not one of them. Oh, well, you said it. I mean, even when he's not healthy enough to play, but he's getting his shots in, he was actually doing baseline jumpers and shooting threes. And so he was actually doing the things that Beaker says he's not, or a source he, is telling. You literally can see it before every game. He shoots threes before right. every game. Right. Like I, I just, <laughs> we didn't get special access. You can see it at the New Orleans at the yeah. Center. You can Trust see me, it. you know, you need the insider source. I go to every home game. I can see him <laughs> doing it every home game. I assume he does it on road games too. Like that was ridiculous. But you know, was he was he was he at any of the practices? Was he interacting with the teammates a lot? Was there anything like that? You know, or you know, we might not have seen that either too. Right. I, I think. Um, look, I, I just happened to be in the pool area the day before we saw him in the game. And, you know, he was there with Larry and, and the rest of the teammates and, you know, just cutting up and having fun and just kind of relaxing. And I think he had just got in because you have to make a conscious decision to want to wear socks in your flip-flops, sweatpants, a black shirt, and a hat when it's 113 degrees, right? So, I mean, they got it's the got to look good and everything, no matter, no, no matter I, if I think he's sweating just got there. I mean, I just, because I, he might he might have liked it, but uh, everybody else, all the other players, I could promise you, were, were not wearing sweatpants when it comes to that. But to, to your point, I, I think what stood out to me was, I think it was in the first quarter timeout, in between quarters, he walked over, and shook everybody's hand. I don't know if they showed that. He went up to Jordan Hawkins. He went up to all of the different players. He hugged everybody, you know, from the equipment guys to the assistant coaches. So he did do that. And again, man, I just, whether it's an elevator chat, whether it's a, a chat waiting, you know, to, to get a beverage or whatever. I never got the sense and feeling that he's a guy that just doesn't want to not communicate with you or, or be 
a good teammate for you. Again, some of that stuff is warranted. Can he be better? Can he understand how to do certain things and process and all of that? But I, I don't think like he's inherently, I don't like you or yeah, I, I think don't that's fair. want to be around. Does that make sense? Like, can yeah, he be it's... more communicative with players? Should he be around more? Can he learn that? Can he do it's... those different things? Sure. The way it is, it's like, you know, you have friends, right? And like some are, you know, friendship takes work. It takes effort, right? Like you've got to text your friends back other things. And some friends aren't good about that, but it doesn't mean they don't like you. It just means they got to try a little bit harder to be your friend. Like, I think that's yeah. kind of Zion. And I think that's one of the themes you've heard from this the, like whole off season. And maybe it's a little done to like help with PR and things like that, you know, but it sounds like for all the mistakes in the past, and there are a lot, and a lot of them are valid, you know, he's trying to fix those things. And showing up to summer league and taking the time when he's not playing and he doesn't need to be there, I think says something to go to the pool and hang out with these guys, to make the effort to walk across the court to go say hi to those guys. Because there was a period of time when he's been on this team, when he's been in Vegas, and didn't do those things. Yeah, At least he's doing them now. And I'll say this again. The advantage of being there for 12 days. I, I can tell you, and again, I, you and I, we could have an entire locked on pills on how to PR one-on-one -on -one and how to get your message better across as a basketball team. But I'll say this, Jake, um, because especially when I heard this, I'm so like, much trouble with them. <laughs> I, I'm like, I'm like, dude, it, it takes 10 seconds, 10 seconds. And you would have people like, you know, season tickets, doing something. I, hear, hear what I'm about to say. From the beginning of the summer, right? Every single Pels player has spent a very large amount of time in the facility over there. So CJ McCollum, to the point where they, they're redoing the court and stuff. He's out of high school getting his work in here in New Orleans because they're, they're refurbishing the practice facility court and all of that. So while they're not doing everything at the facility right now because they're getting a new court, players are finding other places to go work out right now. Now we don't gotcha. know that you don't know that. I, I just happen to hear that. So I'm going to tell you that to make just so Pell's fans know there's legit players here in new Orleans mm -hmm. have been working the entire time in doing that. So, and that includes Zion that includes oh, yeah. Brandon Ingram. They, they, they already literally, I had a coach tell me that, He's that he's that guy, you know, Trey and, and Herb, they have to tell them to go home. So it, mm -hmm. it's still the same thing. Look, EJ Liddell and I were talking for a very brief moment as we're about to board, as we're as we're about to um board our connecting flight on uh back there going Austin on the way home. And one of the things that EJ says is gonna go home for like three, four weeks and get right back here, you know, in August and get back to working out. So, like I said. I, I I was told. Name a player. They're all they're all there. They're they, all no, they have been. Out. I can tell you that. Yeah, they they yeah. this. It seems yeah. like a for a lot of guys, and especially photo, though, like, right? I mean, like send a tweet. I mean, you could just put it out there. Zion just holding a basketball and he just looks sweaty. Like put give him a the, cotton shirt so you have like the sweat V and the sweat rings, and it could just be there. It just he's looking at the free throw line. That's it. You ain't got to show me what he's doing. And all of a the, sudden, that's it's done. It's over. The most shocking thing you just said was they're making a player take a connecting flight from Vegas to well, New Orleans well, instead of flying <laughs> direct here. Yeah. Well, everyone goes their separate ways. So yeah, like, you know, I know, I know. That's I not like a team being like, we're yeah, going to be yeah, cheap. Yeah. You, you know, we're well, not going to pay. I tell you what, I, I felt better than the poor scouts that uh, Aaron was texting when we were in Austin. We had like 20 minutes to get from our plane to another. We were on the tarmac for an hour. And when we get out, that's when we learned that the Vegas airport got shut down because it was too hot. Apparently, there's not enough lift on your airplanes when the heat, when the when the, the air is that hot. If you have a full plane and it's full of fuel and it's full of passengers, so I I'm like I, not not that I didn't believe. I, I go on Twitter and sure enough, there's a passenger saying his flight. They were asking as many as seventy people to get off the plane, offering five hundred dollar vouchers. For, because if not, you couldn't take off. So they had scouts on the tarmac for two hours. I can tell you when we were just sitting in that one hour, it was like an oven on that airplane, even though the air is, is blowing. And I'm just like, this is not, this is not fun. So 
Look, I think everyone just wanted to get out by the time it was. It was 117, dude, the last two days we were there. It it's crazy. brutal. It's, there's no humidity. It's still hot. It's, if you it, can get in the find some oven. shade, it's not too an bad. An oven's an oven, like, Jake. An oven's yeah, it's still an oven. Warm. There you go. Every, and now we got, like, not astrophysicists, but, like, something else. <laughs> Gus Kattengill, who understands lift and, and things like that on planes. He's also the host of the Sports Hangover on ESPN Radio. We got a little long here, Gus, but this was fun. Thanks for being on, man. Uh, not a problem. And like I said, I, I think the thing that, that I took out of this was I think Hawkins will be fine. Liddell's going to be interesting to see where he goes. Uh, you know, even Carlo Matkovich, he struggled early and then the, that, that light sort of switch. He has to get adjusted to the speed. I, I, mm-hmm. I kind of joked with Aaron Summers, Jake. They may have the best G League team ever. Like, don't look at if Liddell and Matkovich or, you know, some of these other players go down there. They need minutes. It's what you said. Look, just use your hand. You know where your starting five is. Then there's Trey. Then there's you know Larry Nance. There's Najee. There's Alvarado. I even got to Dyson Daniels and Jordan Hawkins. So right. there's not going to be a lot of minutes. Get them down there to Birmingham. Ball injuries are going to happen. Streaks are going to happen. You could always have some fresh bodies. But I'm telling you, it it's going to be very interesting to follow Birmingham this year if that's the case. And I hadn't even gotten to Liam Robbins. That dude looks like we're gonna see what he's redwood tree. Yeah, we're gonna see what Jake. he does in training camp, and I know they're Jake. very, very high on him. We're gonna need a locked on Birmingham squadron, I guess. Yeah, dude, I'm, I'm telling you, like Liam Robbins is knocking down three running stairs at the Thomas and Mack Center, and he, he is massive. And, and let's not forget, he was an SEC defensive player of the year. Jake, you very you well who with- used to be an SEC defensive player of the year. Was um a- ACC defensive yeah. player of the year. They've gotten really good with these seniors who have like defensive yeah. chops. I'm curious to see what everyone's going to do. It's going to yeah. be fun. Herb, Jose, yeah. and now Liam. You know, <laughs> if it's, it's, I mean, they have a track good. record from some of this stuff. They have a track record with developing two way guys too. You know, is yeah. Cebron the next one of those? Right, Jose was one. Najee, uh, Kenrich Williams. Like, it's a very good track record with all of that. So the player development side of things with the Pelicans, I actually think is. Quite good, especially for a small market team where you need all of that. So training camp, look, we're 75 days away from the start of basketball, uh, from media day, from media day. So it's going to be here before we realize it. So I'm excited. I appreciate you coming on today. Uh, and that's going to do it for this episode of Locked On Pelicans. Everyone, make sure you be coming every day or listen Monday through Friday. If you want to join the show, Thursday, 7 p.m. Central. As always, I'm your host, Jake Madison, at Nola Jake on Twitter. I'll be back with you all then.